morning, and welcome to the Epilepsy Foundation of New Jersey's webinar series. Tonight's topic will be behavioral and psychiatric problems with epilepsy presented by Jean Young from the Center for Neurological and Neurodevelopmental Health. Jean has 23 years of pediatric nursing experience, including work in ho hospitals, home care, schools, and offices. She received her master's degree from Rutgers University. Jean is board certified through the America, American Nurses Credentialing Center as a pediatric nurse practitioner. A member of the Association of Child Neurology Nurses, she is presently focusing her expertise on clinical research programs at CNNH. She has authored a case study published in the Journal of Pediatric Healthcare and co-authored other articles dealing with pediatric neurological issues. Jean is also the parent of a child with epilepsy. Thank you, Jean, for attending and for presenting this topic, and you may begin. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Welcome, everyone. Um, I understand that there's uh, people with epilepsy, their family members, as well as uh, professionals who work with people with epilepsy in the listening audience. And I feel a lot of connection with all of these people um, because I've, I've worked in uh, pediatric neurology for more than nine years now and um, also being the parent of um, a young adult who has uh, epilepsy. Um, so uh, that I feel like this is an important topic and um, we'll go ahead and get started. We know that um, 20 to 30 percent of patients with epilepsy have uh, some kind of psychiatric disturbance um, and the reasons for this are uh, multiple and varied. Um, the symptoms of the psychiatric disturbance can be caused by the seizures or a common brain pathology, or sometimes they just happen to coexist. Um, other causes include a genetic predisposition, a developmental disturbance, alteration of receptor sensitivity, endocrine or hormonal changes. Um, it could be the result of um, medication or surgical treatment of the epilepsy. Um, and also the psychosocial burden of epilepsy um, can cause some of these uh, behavioral and psychiatric problems. So there are multiple factors or causes for these problems. Um, the most common psychiatric conditions that we see in epilepsy are depression, anxiety, and psychosis. So we're going to focus um, most of the discussion tonight on those three conditions. Um, we'll first talk about depression. Um, this is the most frequent psychiatric comorbidity in persons with epilepsy. And some studies have shown a correlation between mood disorders and seizures of partial onset. So a person who is depressed may present with feelings of sadness, loneliness, despair, or self-reproach. They may show physical signs of psychomotor retardation or slowness in their movements. They may withdraw from social contact. They may have a loss of appetite or um, changes in their sleep. And of course, all of these symptoms can cause a significant impact on the people, the person's quality of life. There's always um, a concern regarding an increased risk for self-injury or suicide in someone who's depressed. And when we look at um, depression in people with epilepsy, it's very important to look at the timing of the symptoms in relation to seizures. So we'll take a look at that. So some people can have pre-ictal symptoms or symptoms of depression that begin right before a seizure. So these symptoms can appear hours to days before a seizure happens. And uh, kind of the dis Distinguishing symptom is this feeling of irritability, um, a lack of pleasure when someone finds certain activities or pursuits pleasurable and then they no longer find those things um, giving them a sense of pleasure. Um, they have difficulty concentrating. There's a sense of hopelessness. So someone with uh, seizures may begin to have these feelings um, a few hours before a seizure or a few days before. Um, and what we see is that usually those symptoms or feelings go away after they have a seizure. 
um, patients can also have ictal symptoms of depression. So that's symptoms that occur at the time of the seizure. So a simple partial seizure, some people call that an aura, may present as a sudden mood change to feelings of sadness or even suicidal ideation or guilt or hopelessness. So the actual seizure aura presents as a mood change. Often these symptoms last for a very brief period of time, sometimes less than 30 seconds, followed by an alteration of consciousness leading to a complex partial seizure or a generalized uh, tonic-clonic seizure. Then we can look at depression symptoms that may occur after a seizure. The symptoms of depression are often very common after a seizure. Sometimes they last for about 24 hours. They're often associated with anxiety and sleep and appetite changes in that period after the patient had a seizure. And these feelings and symptoms can often really impact someone's uh, quality of life. So we've looked at symptoms that occur before during and after a seizure, which can be kind of brief and time limited. And then we can also look at what happens in between the seizures or the interictal period. Persons with epilepsy often experience atypical features of depression. Well, what are the typical symptoms of depression? Well, someone who has been diagnosed with major depression disorder may have this constant sense of hopelessness or despair. And the key thing is that that sense of hopelessness or despair actually interferes with their ability to work, sleep, eat, and enjoy their normal activities. So they may present with symptoms of fatigue, feelings of worthlessness, impaired concentration, this feeling of anhedonia or a feeling where they don't get pleasure out of activities and things that normally give them pleasure. They may have symptoms of restlessness, and they may have weight loss or weight gain and changes in their sleep patterns. So those are the kind of the typical way that depression presents. And when we say someone with epilepsy might have atypical features, that means, again, this prominent irritability poor frustration tolerance and mood lability that they experience. And sometimes family members who live with someone with epilepsy just describe that as that person's personality, when actually it could be symptoms of depression. And again, the symptoms in between the seizures can last a few hours to several days and then kind of disappear and come back, kind of unrelated to symptoms. Uh, unrelated to the seizures, I'm sorry. Um, so these interictal symptoms of depression can kind of remit and recur, whereas someone who does not have epilepsy and is diagnosed with major depression may have symptoms all the time. So how is depression treated in someone with epilepsy? Well, they have found that the best treatment, the most important treatment, is good seizure control um, so that there, uh, those um, symptoms of depression that occur around seizures are not happening as frequently if they're not having seizures as frequently. Patients with epilepsy with sustained episodes of depression, the ones we talked about that have the symptoms in between seizures, may benefit from treatment with antidepressants. And some of the anti-epileptic drugs that are on the market have some antidepressant effects. Um, so um, we mentioned uh, valproate, gabapentin, carbamazepine, and lamotrigine are uh, four anti-epileptic medications that many patients take that may have some mood uh, elevating effects. Um, there are some antidepressants um, a class of antidepressants called MIAO inhibitors that can actually lower the seizure threshold and are usually avoided in patients that have epilepsy. Um, and another important treatment for depression is psychotherapy, 
and uh, they found that that is really just as important as treatment with medication. Now we'll move on to anxiety. And um, they have uh, found that uh, anxiety can occur in up to 50% of people that have epilepsy. Symptoms of anxiety include a feeling of fear or apprehension accompanied by muscle tension, restlessness, decreased concentration, confusion, and insomnia. Um, the symptoms of anxiety biologically may be related to abnormal functioning of these GABA receptors in the brain. Okay, the GABA receptors are the chief inhibitory neurotransmitters um, in the brain. So uh, it's a chemical messenger that's widely distributed in the brain and actually helps control fear and anxiety when the neurons are overexcited. Anxiety is found to be common in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. The amygdala is a structure in the brain that's very important for producing anxiety symptoms as well as epileptic discharges. So it's an almond-shaped group of neurons deep inside the temporal lobe, and this amygdala plays a key role in processing emotions, and it also forms part of the limbic system. Again, we'll look at anxiety as to when it occurs in relationship to seizures. So someone can experience anxiety during a seizure, okay? So they can have an isolated panic or fear, usually of a very short duration. And this is the most frequent psychiatric symptom presenting as seizure activity. So a, a patient may feel all of a sudden a very intense feeling of fear or panic. And then it can be associated with a feeling of depersonalization uh, or deja vu or other autonomic system, uh, symptoms, uh, such as a, a feeling in the stomach, a rising feeling in the stomach, or a nausea, or sweating, uh, those type of symptoms, along with this feeling of uh, intense feeling of fear. Now to distinguish, is it a seizure, anxiety associated with a seizure, versus a panic attack, because some people can be diagnosed or have uh, what's called panic attacks. What we find is that panic attacks are longer in duration and there's no loss of awareness of their surroundings. So the anxiety related to a seizure is often very short in duration, could be less than 30 seconds. A panic attack may last for several minutes. It's a general correlation between the topography where the brain disturbs are originating from and the speed of maturation of brain. Uh, this is a slide of a child with hemimegalencephaly. This is a um, you can see the cursor, I think. So this is the left side of the brain. This is the right side of the brain. The right side looks pretty good. The left side is very big. There's a big ventricle in the center of the brain. And the, uh, the cortex this is a condition called hemimegalencephaly, where the large hemisphere is the abnormal hemisphere. And this often gives you infantile spasms, and the treatment of that is removing the bad 
so far with leaving for me to sort of talk about the different causes or so-called ideology of the empathized characters. The most common, I think, is malformation of the cortical development. So by this I mean cortical dysplasia, uh, heterotopic malformation, just a abnormally formed brain, uh, which uh, occurs in the first and second trimester of pregnancy. Uh, however, other causes are prenatal, perinatal, and postnatal injuries, stroke. Often in the third trimester pregnancy, in a mom who had maybe diabetes, hypertension, or a predisposition to having strokes, a thick blood, if you will. Uh, infection. can also cause injury to the brain. Baby could have uh, 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 various kinds of a group B strep infection, staph infection in the nursery, so on, so on. The brain is injured. Baby goes home. Three months later, four months later, infantile spasms come. Uh, or hypoxic ischemia, same thing. Uh, difficult delivery, uh, hypoxia to the brain, ischemia to the brain, brain injury, cerebral palsy, and the spasms come. So that's a big cause as well. Chromosomal disorders, Down syndrome is closely associated with the fatal spasms. Um, the uh, neurocutaneous disorders, these are the so-called skin brain disorders where the skin is abnormal, the brain is also abnormal, they have birthmarks, so tuberculosis is the most common of these, they have white patches on the skin, they have abnormalities in the brain, and they Often have infantile spasms. Neurofibromatosis with a cafe or lay spots, the dark spots in the skin. Uh, I just, these are just two of them, but there are a whole bunch of neurocutaneous syndromes, which can all be used to infantile spasms. Metabolic disorders, various inborn errors of chemical disorders, where a particular enzyme is not formed, and you can have uh, these genetic uh, disorders, <coughs> which are metabolic disorders, Maybe this balance. A tumor in the brain, usually that's, these are benign tumors. This is a great diagnosis to have. I know you didn't 
So at that time, I was very interested in doing research on endothelospasms, not so much for surgery, but more for to study the uh, metabolism of the brain of children with endothelospasms. And here's a child with a normal CT scan, this image, that image, and the bottom image, and a normal MRI scan, whose PET scan showed an abnormality. You see the right side of the brain here, the temple lobe, is using less energy compared to the left. was an age one year two months. Well, and you can see again the temple lobe uh, uh, lower on the right compared to the left, and then again further down. And these are three different slices of the brain. Same patient and more metabolism on the right side compared to the left. Well, I kind of sat on it, didn't know quite what to do. Uh, the child did very badly. Nine months later, I scanned him again. This is a different scanner. You know, the technology was progressing rapidly, and we got better scanners. Nine months later, I repeated the PET scan, and uh, same thing, decrease on the right left side, decrease on the right side, decrease on the right side. Two years, eight months, still a better scan, I repeated it again, this one was very traumatic. It was very nice resolution at that time to see the temple lobe. Very abnormal on the right side compared to the left side. And so, it was at that time that I said, uh, you know, um, this is very, um, this is very interesting. Uh, what can we do with this? And together with a colleague of mine, Alan Schumann, who is an electrogeographer, and we went to the surgeon, uh, Dr. Peacock, uh, who's retired now, but more Peacock just come from South Africa. And we basically convinced him to operate on these patients with normal MRI scans. He resisted at first because of the MRI being normal. Uh, and what he finally agreed to it was took out the surgical Cortex and 
during the critical time of the development undergo a kind of generalization to uh, emerge as the spasms. Uh, and uh, here's a scheme of that. So here's a, uh, a, uh, um, I don't know, um, uh, just a cartoon of a, uh, a normal court. 